When I was a teenager, my dad made it real clear what his plans for my life were. He wanted me to uh, become a businessman, go to the Macomb School of Business and become an entrepreneur, become a millionaire by the age of 30 and buy him a bass boat. <laughs> and I thought, well, I don't know if I'm really wired that way. I'm, I'm, I really like math and so uh, maybe I'll become a civil engineer like my mom's dad. And possibly even, you know, combine the two, have my own civil engineering business and get him that bass boat that he wants. Uh, but then as a teenager, I, you know, went to church all the time. And I heard my pastor, Jimmy Draper, uh, say a little phrase, a little saying on more than one occasion. And it was this, that the safest place to be is in the center of God's will. And I thought about that, I chewed on that, and I came to the point where I realized that that's where I want to be as a teenager. I want to be in the middle of God's will, right in the center of God's will, wherever that takes me. Sometimes being in God's will means that you're in a dangerous situation, you're in an uncomfortable situation. Sometimes it means that you suffer. But I want to be in the middle of God's will. And so I believed back then what my pastor said. And I still do today. That being in the middle of God's will is the best place to be. And so the best I could, the best I understood, I tried to focus my life on God. I tried to focus my life on the things that God is concerned about. And when you do that, I discovered that the Lord has a way of taking you to places that you might not have otherwise imagined. Not just geographical places, but places in life, if you understand that. And so you begin this journey of faith. And it's almost as if, uh, if you can imagine this, if you're on a, um, a bicycle built for two, that you get in the back seat and you let the Lord take control. Or if you're in a car, you let the Lord take the steering wheel. And he takes you where he wants you to go. Instead of you being in control of that. And that can be a scary thing for a lot of people to really give the Lord control of their lives. You know, some people have this attitude where they say, well, you know, this life, it's my life. And when I get to heaven, you know, then, then God can sort of take control there. And, and I don't think that's really uh, appropriate for someone that truly believes that Jesus Christ is Lord. If he's Lord, then he is the one who should have control of our lives. And so when you give God control and when you focus on the things of God... When you direct your attention to the things of God, you don't know where God is going to take you. And a lot of people don't like that. I don't know if you can relate to that, um, because most of us, we like to know where we're going. You know, we like to have, at least in, a, in our imagination, an idea that so far down the road, so many years down the road, I'm going to try, I'm going to strive, I'm going to have this goal, this plan to reach this certain place. And so we have an idea of where we might want to go. And to be honest, if we give God control, he may not take us there. He may take us somewhere else. But I would challenge you with this, if this is something that you struggle with, truly giving God control and, and focusing your life on him, if this is something that you struggle with, let me just challenge you with this truth. Even if you have every plan lined out in the world, and you think you know where you're headed, life has a way of not letting you get exactly there, doesn't it? I mean, there are things that happen to us, things that are beyond our control that might cause us to take a detour one way or the other. And so what God actually calls us to is not an idea where we go to God and we say, okay, God, tell me what you have planned for me for the rest of my life, and then I'll decide whether or not I'm going to truly follow you and focus my life on you. No, what God has planned for us is simply this. It's very simple. That your next step will be in line with him. Okay? Just your next step. He wants you to take one step, the step of this day, in line with him. And so... What we must do is simply this. We must focus our life on God today. Focus our life on God today. 
You know, one of the things that's very obvious that you probably never think about is this, that whatever direction in life you travel, you always look that direction first, don't you? I mean, even if you're walking the mall, even if you're walking down the street, you don't look this direction and walk that direction, do you? You don't look this direction and go the other way, do you? No, not for long, right? That's how you get in an accident. You know, distracted driving. It's a big, it's a big topic these days, whether it's a cell phone or whatever else. You're not watching where you're going, and accidents happen that way. And so what we must do, what we must learn to do as Christians, is to look up to Christ. Set our eyes, set our minds on the things that are above. If you have access to a Bible, I invite you to turn to Colossians chapter 3. In Colossians chapter 3, if, if you have a Bible like mine, you already have a marker right there. Isn't that amazing? In Colossians chapter 3, we're going to look at verses 1 through 4. Just four simple verses today. And we will uh, get through this message as quickly as humanly possible. But four simple verses, and I invite you, if you found Colossians chapter 3, to stand with me, please, in honor of the reading of God's Word. If you prefer, you can read along with the verses on the screen behind me. In Colossians 3, we read these words. So, if you have been raised with Christ, seek the things above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died, and your life is hidden with Christ and God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would illumine our minds to the truths of your word, and that by the end of this message, each one of us today would be faced with a very important decision of where we will focus our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. The idea of this passage is very simple. It, it, it's simply this, to look up. To look up. To look where Christ is. To focus our lives, focus our minds, focus everything about us on the things that Christ cares about. Let's look at this uh, first two verses again. So if you've been raised with Christ, seek the things above for Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Again, set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. This idea of setting your mind, is, it literally says be minded. Be minded about things above. And so what does it mean to be minded about things that are above? Does that mean that we get ourselves involved in some type of transcendental you know, meditation? We get ourselves in a dark room in the corner and we close our eyes and we think about things that are literally above? Oh, I'm thinking about clouds. I'm thinking about stars. I'm thinking about hot air balloons. I talk like Patrick from Spongebob. No, I don't think that's it. I, I don't think that's it. In fact, I'm pretty sure it's not. You see, to focus our lives and our minds on things that are above, it's not just about what you think of, and although it includes that. It's not just a way of thinking, but it, it really includes your values, your love. Valuing what Christ values. Loving what Christ loves. Delighting in the things of God. That's what we're talking about. You see, you and I as Christians, we, we need to understand that we live in two realms, in two spiritual realms. Spiritually, we live in a realm that has fallen, and we inherited that realm from Adam. And so living in this fallen realm means that we, we live in a realm that's temporary and it's sinful and it's wicked and it's worthless. And there are all these things that are passing away. And we can devote ourselves to all of those things. We can live for all of those things 
if we want to. There are many people who live for money, even though it's worthless and it's passing away someday. There are people that live for all kinds of wealth. There are people that live for fame. They want to be known as something. There are people that live for all of the different things of this world, all of which eventually will pass away. And so we live in this realm of a, of a world that is not yet redeemed. It's a fallen world. But we also, as Christians, live in a realm, in a sphere, in an era, an eon, whatever you want to call it. We live in the, under the reign of Christ. We live under a redeemed realm. And so the things that are in the redeemed realm are things that are eternal. There are things that are worthwhile. These are things that are, are where Christ rules. We're talking about the rule, the reign of God over these things. And so as Christians living in both of these realms, we must be the ones who seek out those that do not yet know what it means to live under the rule of Christ. And we must make every effort to compel them to join under Christ to believe in Christ and to change teams, if you will, change kingdoms, if you will, to submit themselves to the rule and the reign of Jesus Christ. And so it's our job to seek to help make Christ's rule a reality on earth. We are the ones who call people to Christ. We are the ones who call people to life and life eternal. Because everything else that you might say, this is what my life is about, it's dying away. It's temporary. I'm reminded of one, what one Dallas Cowboy player said back in the 1970s. He was asked this question as they approached the Super Bowl. You have to go back a long time since the Cowboys were in the Super Bowl. But back in the 70s, he was approached and he was asked a question by a reporter. How do you think it's going to feel to play in the ultimate game? And he said, if it's the ultimate game, why are they playing it again next year? He had his own perspective. A perspective that's actually right. The things that this world says are, are so important, they're dying away. And so we must be the ones who focus our lives and our attention on Christ. That's what God has called us to. Now, this is the simple idea of this passage, and Paul gives us three reasons why we should do it. Number one, reason number one, we've been raised with Christ. Look again at verses one and two. It says, so if you have been raised with Christ... Seek the things above. Now, we've already learned in this passage and elsewhere in the New Testament that we have been raised with Christ. We are made one with Christ. We are unified with Him. We identify with Him. And so, Christ has not only, as He has been raised from the dead, so have we. You see, a part of being identified with Christ as a believer in Jesus Christ, it means this, that when you have faith in Jesus Christ, it means that when Jesus died on the cross, your sinfulness died on the cross with him. When Jesus was buried in the earth, your sinfulness was buried with him. When Jesus was raised from the dead, you are raised to walk in a brand new way of life. When Jesus ascended to heaven, you ascended to heaven with him. And when Jesus, now, as the one who has ascended to heaven, as the one who sits at the right hand of God, he is Lord over all of creation, you dwell with him. You live with him. Your life is with Christ, hidden away with Christ in God. And so since this is true, since we are the ones who have been raised with Christ, Paul says, then we need to value what Christ values. 
We need to love who Christ loves. We need to desire what Christ desires. We need to seek His will. Why? Because we've been raised with Christ. He gives us a second reason. We have a new life source. What do I mean by life source? I simply mean by the the reason you live your life. The purpose of your life. Why do you live your life? Some people, hey, I live my life. It's all about money. I'm all about making as much money as I can make. So their life is all about money. Some people say, oh, my life is all about women. I'm just going to bed as many women as I can. That's my goal in life. My life is, is, all about, is all about possessions. I'm going to get as, as many possessions and the greatest possessions that I can have in this world. My life, it's all about power. I want to rule. I want to rule over other people. I want to, I want to be an important person. And so my life is all about power. My life is all about drugs. I just want to feel good all the time. I want to shoot myself up with anything and everything under heaven. And I just want to feel good all the time. If it feels good, do it. That's my motto. Some people, they live for all of these worthless things. These things that do not last. But you and I, we have a different life source. We, as Christians, we think differently. We're wired differently. The world can't understand it. But we read this in these verses. For you died and your life, your life, is hidden with Christ and God. When Christ, who is your life. Think about that. Christ is your life. As a Christian, I hope that you can identify that with that. As a Christian, I hope you'd be able to say, if I asked you this question... What is it that gives you meaning in life? You ought to be able to say, Christ. It is Christ who gives me meaning in life. He is my life. He is my life. And so your life is now hidden with Christ in God. What does that mean? Well, we know that Christ has been raised from the dead. We know that Christ is seated at the right hand of God. By the way, to be seated at the right hand of God means that he has all power and rule and authority. It means that he is Lord over all. And so Christ is Lord over all. He is seated at the right hand of God. He is the Lord of this new age, this new eon, this new realm of redemption that we're a part of, this new kingdom of redemption. And so you have been raised with Christ. You've been exalted with him. For some reason, God says that we're going to share in his glory. We're going to share in the glory of Christ. We don't deserve that. We're nothing special. Christ is special. And yet Christ is going to allow those of us who believe in him to actually share in his glory. We're going to be given glorified bodies one day. We don't deserve that. But that's what Christ is going to do because he loves us so much. And so Christ rules over this world. And in this this sphere, this the sphere of the kingdom of God, this realm of the kingdom of God, Christ is the ruler. And so it is our job to focus on those things that God is concerned about. And that's why Christians today are concerned about things the world just doesn't care about. I mean, the world, you think about that. Christians like to go to church. They should, at least. By the way, if you're bad-mouthing church, I don't know how else to put it, but you're bad-mouthing the bride of Christ. It's usually a bad idea to bad-mouth someone's bride, especially the bride of Christ. Now, I know the churches are not perfect. They're made up of imperfect people, but... In the end, we're the bride of Christ, and we will be made perfect one day. And so Christians are those that like to go to church. The world doesn't care about church. If all the churches of the world just sort of disappeared, the world wouldn't care. The world doesn't care about church. 
But Christians do very much care about being a part of the fellowship and the family of God. The world doesn't care about world missions. It doesn't care about world evangelism. That's something strictly Christians care about. Why do we care about that? Because we believe. We believe in the message that if people are not saved, they'll go to a devil's hell. We believe in that message, and so we care about that. The world doesn't care about having a pro-life ethic. The world doesn't care about that. You can see just how much the world doesn't care with some of the things that people are saying about abortion. How much people are just eager to murder preborn infants. How wicked that is. The world doesn't care. The world, why is it that Christians are the ones that are on the forefront of the pro-life movement? Why is that? It's because we believe something. We believe that not only is that a child, but we believe something eternal is occurring in that mother's womb. That that child has a chance for life and life eternal through Christ. And so we very much care about human life from conception to the grave and every aspect in between. Why is it that we care so much about the things that the world doesn't care about? It's because, I hope, our minds are focused on Christ. We care about the things that Jesus cares about. We care about the things of God. You see, you and I have a life source that this world doesn't know. What is it that makes you Christians tick? In a word, it's Christ. He makes us tick. He makes us go. He gives our lives meaning. And the world looks at us and says, I don't get it. And they don't. And that's okay. And it brings us to reason number three. The third reason that we should focus our lives on Christ is because of our future glory. Our future glory. Look again at verses three and four. It says, for you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. And then it says, when Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. See, right now, the reason for your living, Christian, we know that it's Christ, but right now, Christ is hidden from this world. Christ is hidden in the very presence of God. But there's coming a day when the king will return. The king is coming. And the king is preeminent over this world. The king is preeminent over all of redemption. The king is preeminent over his church. And when the king returns and Jesus appears, when he is revealed, that is when the very source of your life will be revealed to this world. That's when the world will finally see Why? We valued what we valued. The world will finally see why we loved what we loved. The world will finally see why we desired what we desired. The world will finally see why we sought after his will. The world will finally see it. And the world will say, oh. I get it now. And we will finally be vindicated. Unbelievers on that day will realize that they based their lives on the wrong things. And on that day, it will be too late. So I encourage you, Christians, Look up. Seek out the things that are above. 
the things that Christ desires. Value his values and love what he loves. Desire what he desires. Seek his will. Why? Listen, Christian. You have a greater destiny in God's economy, in God's plans, than what the world has to offer you here. We must seek after God. Can you imagine what it would be like to be a person who is focused on the things of God? What it would be like if you led your family in focusing on the things of God? What would it be like if this entire church was known as the church that focused on the things of God? Today, if you're not yet a believer, I know this is true about you, that your life is not focused on the things of God. And that's okay because we've all been there before. Every last one of us has been there. But today you have a choice. You have an option. You have an availability to you that you today can be in Christ. You today can place your faith in Christ. How do you do that? You need to recognize who Jesus Christ is. He is the Lord over all. He is the King over all. And you need to recognize what he did for you. Jesus died on the cross for you to pay for all of your sins. And to offer you forgiveness. He rose from the grave for you to give you eternal life. And today, if you trust him, if you confess him as Lord, he'll save you. He'll transfer you not only into a new kingdom, but also what we might call God's family. You'll be part of the family of God. And you'll have this promise from Jesus that the Father will never let you go. Nobody can snatch you out of the Father's hands. No matter what happens, no one can snatch you out of the Father's hands because the Father is greater than all and He loves you.